Well, some great things have already been happening today. It's a good day to be in church. Amen. <laughs> Amen. One of our worship leaders this morning, she could not sleep at all last night. She had terrible pain in her arm. And she said, Angie, I don't know if I'm going to make it tomorrow. And she came this morning and we prayed for her. And right then and there, the pain went away. Amen. God is good. Amen. And I believe a lot of other things have been happening today. I'm actually going to be talking quite a bit about the shepherd today and about sheep. And so I think that's beautiful, the way that Bethany was flowing in the spirit with that. If you want to come in a little bit closer, you can see kind of what we've prepared here uh, for you today. So if you're kind of on the outsides, if you want to move on in, feel free to do that. Um, get nice and comfortable. Uh, we've been talking about growing in the Lord lately. And I don't know about you, but when we talk about growing, or when I think about growing, I think about food. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm a mom. <laughs> I've got a 16-year-old, an almost 13-year-old, an 11-year-old, and their nutrition and their health is very important to me. And, you know, I mean, as a mom, you sacrifice your body for several months for them to have life. And so you care a lot about their growth and their development. And so uh, my kids will attest to the fact that I'm a bit uh, strict, a bit of a stickler about what they put in their mouths. <laughs> but um, just, the same as, just the same as we're concerned about our natural children and what they put in their mouths and, and, that, and their healthy growth and development, our Father God is concerned about us as well. But I have a few funny things to share with you too, because it can be pretty funny to try to get young children to eat what's good for them. Uh, one mom said to her child, eat your dinner. And the child said, my mouth hurts. And the mom said, it didn't hurt when we had ice cream. And the child said, yeah, but I wanted that. <laughs> Another dad said, my kid threatened to hold her breath until I gave her dessert. She's now passed out on the kitchen floor. I do not negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> this four-year-old asked his mom, can I have some of your candy? The mother said, I got this for Mother's Day. And the four-year-old said, you're only a mom because of me. <laughs> A dad said, oh, I think I ate too much. And the kid answered, yeah, but not just today. <laughs> A dad said, I asked my one-year-old, so think about the little toddler. I asked my one-year-old if she wanted pizza. She nodded so, head, so hard she fell over. <laughs> the mom said, my kids can't find their shoes when they need them, but they find that tiny piece of onion in their dinner. <laughs> One mom asked her seven-year-old, do you like your soup? And their child answered, it tastes like broccoli punching me in the face. <laughs> oh, those are good. I love it. Our kids are precious to us. And just like our kids are precious to us, we are precious to our Heavenly Father. Amen. When the Bible talks about food, it often talks about a meal. It often talks about coming to a table or a place where fellowship between two or more people is going to happen. It was often more than just eating for the, to stay alive, but many times we see it was also about relationship to keep the soul healthy. And often we see meals in Scripture where spiritual things happened as well. In Genesis 18, for example, during the heat of the day, the Lord appeared to Abraham. So Abraham prepared a meal for him. It was at that time that the Lord told Abraham, by this time next year, you'll be holding your promised son, Isaac. Amen? Genesis 25, Esau sold his birthright, a potential intimate, close, covenant relationship with the Lord, he sold that for food to satisfy his own craving. In Genesis 43, it was over a meal that Joseph and his brothers were reunited and restored in their relationship to each other. In Exodus 18, it was Aaron and the elders that ate a meal with Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. And it says in Exodus, they ate it in the presence of the Lord. And the very next day was when Jethro gave Moses that valuable advice that kept Moses and the people 
from going crazy and from burning out in the wilderness. Another very special meal in scripture is the Passover. We think about the Passover. That was the time when the Lord delivered Israel from Egypt. And it's also a meal that points us to what Jesus has done for us. In 1 Samuel 25, Abigail saved the lives of her household with food. <laughs> She took food to David and his hungry men and said, please don't do this. Please don't have this on your reputation. It was food that saved the day. Well, and Abigail. <laughs> In 1 Kings 17, Elijah asked the widow for her last meal. And when she obeyed, the miracle was released that saved her life and the life of her son. In 1 Kings 17, or sorry, 2 Kings 4, a wealthy woman consistently invited Elisha to eat at her house. For many years, she said, whenever you're in town, you come and eat at my house. But then one day, her only son got very sick and he died. And it was because she had fed the prophet for so many years that she was brave enough to call him to come and lay hands on her son. And her son was raised back to life. The last example I want to share with you is the Last Supper. What a powerful meal that was. It was not only powerful for Jesus and his disciples, but the things that Jesus said and the things that he did in that meal still hold deep and meaningful lessons for us. Today I want to focus in on another meal in Scripture. It's one of those meals that the Father knows that we need, and we would be wise to eat it. Now, I know that Psalm 23 is a very familiar passage to most of us, but I want us to take a look at it again today. So let's put Psalm 23 up there. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Now, you've probably heard before that sheep are not the brightest of animals. <laughs> and we are oftentimes called sheep in the word of God. <laughs> but you know what? I, I don't really mind being called a sheep because if we go back to verse 1 and we look at that, there's been times in my life when I have needed God's provision. Have you ever needed God's provision? And have you ever said this exact verse? Oh, I, I, I seriously need God's provision, but the Lord is my shepherd. Amen? I don't mind being called a sheep because there's been times in my life, like in verse 2, that I've needed to lay down and take it easy. I've needed to stop what I'm doing and just rest. And if it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't have. He makes me lie down, and he leads me beside quiet waters. You know, there's definitely been times when I've needed his guidance, when I've needed his refreshing, when I've needed him to help me stay on the right paths, like it says in verse 3. And I've been so deeply thankful to the Lord for the times that he's been with me in those dark valleys. How many of you have been through a dark valley? Yeah, we've all been through times of confusion. We've all been through times where we can't see which way we're going, what the next step is that we're going to take. But the Lord has been with us. Amen? We're all a little bit like sheep. We're all a little bit defenseless. We're all a little bit helpless. And God made us that way so that we would need him and we would have relationship with him. The next verse, though, verse 5, is the one that I want us to focus on today. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, notice that in the progression of this psalm, we just made it out of this really dark valley, right? 
as the sheep, you lead me through the valley of the shadow of death, right? We get through it, and then we come out to a time of fellowship with the Lord. He prepares a table, but where does he prepare it? In the presence of our enemies? <laughs> I can just imagine this shaky sheep coming out of this dark valley, like, oh, I'm so glad we made it. And my eyes are adjusting to the light coming out of the valley, and I see this beautiful green grass. Oh, the table land that the shepherd has prepared for me. But then as my eyes adjust to the light, I look around and I'm like, that's a wolf's den over there. That's, that's, a, that's some big bushes over there where some lions could hide. In fact, I think I see some eyes peering out at me through those bushes. Wait a minute, shepherd, wait a minute. I don't think I want to eat here. Let's go back and eat where those green grass and that still water. Let's go back there, <laughs> right? How many of you are with me? It's a bit stressful to eat if you've got enemies around you, don't you think? Yes? Hello? Anybody there? <laughs> if I was the sheep, I'd be saying, ah, no thanks, no thanks. You just take that rod of yours and get rid of all these enemies for me, and then we'll sit down and eat, right? Isn't that, I mean, that's what we would say, right? But that's not what, that's not what he says. Come on, Lord. <laughs> but what we see is that Psalm 23 isn't the only place that this happens in Scripture. One example of this is in John 21. This is after Jesus rose from the dead. We see him making breakfast for his disciples. Again, a very special meal in Scripture. Their minds were filled with confusion and doubt about their future. They had seen their Savior and their hope killed and hung on a cross. The things that they expected to see happen didn't happen. They were in a dark, dark valley of confusion, the darkest valley of the shadow of death that they had ever been through. And they were coming out of it now, and Jesus had been raised back to life, and he prepared a meal for them. And what did he do at that meal? He restored them to relationship with him. He said, Peter, do you love me? Three times, the same number of times that Peter had denied him, he restored Peter back into relationship. He restored each one of his disciples back into their calling. They had gone back to be fishermen, and he said, oh, no, no, you're made for more than this. Come, come again, trust me again. Remember who I've called you to be, fishers of men. Our shepherd invites us to rest, to eat, and to fellowship with him in the midst of the chaos of life. Sometimes he doesn't calm the storm. Sometimes he doesn't tell the wind and the waves to be still. He tells us to be still. And we need to calm ourselves. He invites us to take a step of growth in our relationship with him. To not only trust him in the dark, when we're in that dark valley, he's teaching us to overcome our fear of the unknown. We can't see what's in the valley. We can't see the enemies, and that's what scares us, right? But once we come out, he prepares a table right where we can see our enemies. He's encouraging us to take a step of growth, to take another step of trust in him, to peel back another layer of our heart and trust in him. If I could get um, a couple, Olivia to come and help me here, and if I could get one older gentleman, um, adult male, thank you, Justice, to come and be the shepherd here at the other side of the table. Is there a, a gentleman here that would like to help me out? All right, Justice. <laughs> so our shepherd, Justice, has prepared a table for the sheep, Olivia. <laughs> so give her a glass and pour her some juice. <laughs> so now, have you ever been eating in a restaurant and had people walk by that you didn't know 
and they interrupted you just to chit chat? Yeah? It happened to me and Emma and Olivia just recently. We were um, around the corner down the street at a Chinese noodle restaurant. And we're sitting there, go ahead, you can eat. You've prepared the table. Enjoy the fellowship. <laughs> we're sitting in a Chinese restaurant and we're eating. And these two guys that we've never met before came up to our table and they were like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and we said, we live here. You live here? They asked us. Yes. Oh, what do you do here? I said, oh, well, we, we teach there at New Life. Oh, okay, have a good day. <laughs> it's so funny, you know, but it happens so fast that somebody can just come up and interrupt a meal, right? Has that ever happened to you before? Maybe it's somebody you knew that you didn't know was going to be at the restaurant, but they walked up and they just started interrupting your meal and started chit-chatting with you, and so you just kind of stop eating and talk with them, and your focus has now shifted from the person that you're with to the person who's just interrupted you, right? And how many times nowadays have you walked into restaurants and seen people on their phones instead of talking to the person at the table? <laughs> happens all the time. Can I just say that we need to put our phones away when, we're, when we come to the table? And it's not just me being an old person. <laughs> the people that we're sitting at with the table have incredible value and incredible worth. And it would be wise of us to put our distractions away and to spend time listening and talking and spending time in the presence of God together. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? We are the family of God. Let's show honor, let's show value and respect to each other when we're sitting at the table together. Okay, that was a sidetrack, all right. <laughs> all right, so let's get back to the meal with our shepherd. No, 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 you're fine, you keep eating. <laughs> so we know that our daily time with the Lord is precious, right? That's our chance to come and to spend time with him. But how many times is our daily time with the Lord interrupted, right? The phone rings, a child screams, something happens, right? Like our daily time with the Lord can get interrupted. And if those natural interruptions aren't happening, there's interruptions in our own thoughts. Sometimes you'll be having your time with the Lord of fellowship, and all of a sudden you'll hear, you're not going to make it. Have you ever heard that before? This problem that you're facing right now, it's too big for you. The shepherd's forgotten you. Have you ever heard that before? In your time with the Lord or when you're going about your day, maybe, just maybe, one of those enemies that's surrounding you is trying to pull up a chair at your table. There are enemies around you they do not want you to have this fellowship time with the shepherd. You might hear, you're not going to make it. I think we have that on the slide, Pisa. But what is the truth of God's word? What does the truth say? When we hear the enemy say, you're not going to make it. This problem's too big. God has forgotten you. The truth is, he leads us through the valley. And we know that, right? We've been through valleys before. He leads us through the valley, and he's never going to leave us or forsake us. Amen? Amen? He's a good shepherd. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. Amen? You might hear another one. The enemy might have tried this one with you. It's better at another table. This relationship that you're in, this job that you're at, this career path that you're on, it's better somewhere else. It's too hard here. It's better at another table. Nobody really knows how hard it is for you. You shouldn't feel bad about leaving. Nobody understands where you're at and how you're feeling. You need to lead yourself out of here and take care of yourself because nobody else is going to do it. Have you heard that before? You know, when the enemy sits down, he's pretty sly. He sits down and he says, you're not going to make it. Nobody's taking care of you. And before you know it, 
he's stealing your sustenance. He's stealing your food that your shepherd prepared for you. But if you let him sit down, what's he going to do? He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But what is the truth of God's word? Is it better at another table? Is it better in another marriage? No. No. The truth is the fullest life possible is right here at the table with him. Amen? The fullest life. Amen. That's right. Families aren't perfect. Churches aren't perfect. Jobs aren't perfect. Wherever, we, wherever you have people, you have conflict. <laughs> it's just a fact of life, right? Wherever people are, there's going to be problems. <laughs> there's going to be issues. But that's life. But our shepherd is with us. He's here at the table with us to give us advice, to help us to stick with it, to help us to say, no, I am not going to leave this table. I am not going to leave my church family. I am not going to leave my spouse. I am not going to leave this job. I am going to trust in the Lord. I am going to trust in the Lord that he is with me. James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. Ask in faith, and God will give it liberally, freely to anyone that asks. Our shepherd teaches us how to forgive. He teaches us how to resolve conflict. He doesn't teach us to get up and leave. He teaches us to stay and be still and work on it and do it with his help, not on our own strength, but in his strength. Amen? Something else you might hear. If the enemy is pulling up a seat at your table, everyone is against you. Nobody likes you. Did you hear what your friend said about you? Did you hear what they were saying about you out there? The pastor didn't even smile at you today. Your boss didn't give you that promotion that you deserved because he doesn't like you. Everybody's against you. You know, that person's much better than you. Doesn't the enemy do that every single time? He tries to get us to compare ourselves to others. He tries to get us to feel rejected, to feel alone. But the truth is, if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? You have a shepherd that is for you. You have a shepherd that loves you. You have a shepherd that is here to help you. Those that are with you are greater than those that are against you. Amen? God has placed you in a spiritual family so that you can learn how to have healthy, life-giving relationships. Amen? The last thing, and I'm sure there's other things that the enemy has tried to say to you, and you know what those are and what lies that you need to rebuke, but one more really common one that he says, number four, is that you're not good enough you are not enough. You're not good enough for God. You've made too many mistakes. That secret sin issue, that disqualifies you from doing anything for God. Your weaknesses are too great. How many times have you heard that? <laughs> I know, I've heard it a lot of times. <laughs> You're not good enough. You're not enough. Look at this person. Look at that person. Again, telling us to compare ourselves to others. Oh, just let the strong ones do it. Oh, just let the pastors do it. They don't need you. You're not enough. God doesn't need you, and he doesn't care about you, or else he would have made you more talented. Has that thought ever crossed your mind? But does the clay say to the potter, why did you make me this way? No. We trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, and we don't lean on our own understanding. The truth is, Jesus said he's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd who laid down his life for you. You are so valuable. You are so precious to him. Even in your weakest state, even when you're like a sheep, completely defenseless, not very bright, making mistakes right and left, giving the shepherd more work, you are still of great value 
to him. And not because of what you're doing, but just because of who you are. He loves you so much. If I can have the worship team come back up, I want to make sure we have some time to pray. We might not be able to stop the enemy from prowling around because it is the shepherd that prepared the table in the presence of our enemies. But we can stop him from pulling up a chair, right? You might not be able to stop him from prowling around and talking to you and saying this and saying that, but you don't have to let him sit down at your table. You don't have to keep listening to him. Amen? Thank you, Justice. Thank you, Olivia. The truth is, God has given us more than enough. And you're welcome to come up and have some snacks after the service. (laughs) Because what does the end of Psalm 23 say? My cup overflows. Amen? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? We're going to take some time right now, right where we are. We're not going to move. We're not going to do anything else. We're not going to stand up. We're just going to take some time right now, right where you are, just to spend some time with the shepherd. Let's come to the table today. Let's come to the table to fellowship with him right now. And let's close our eyes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just begin to ask the Holy Spirit to show us if we've allowed the enemy a seat at our table. Are there some lies that we've believed? Are there some things that we need to reject? Let's just spend some time at the table with the shepherd right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'll come right now and speak to each person, Lord. Just come right now and speak to each person, we pray, O oh Lord. Just come by the power of your Spirit, Father.
that you came today and we're looking forward to having you back again next week. Amen. God bless you.